Hello and welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today, my guest is Alan Dibb, the best-selling author of the book, The One Page Marketing Plan. The book was a number one best-selling book. It's an international bestseller and has been for the last four years. Alan helps businesses all over the world develop and improve their marketing capabilities using the one page marketing plan framework. In the past, Alan has started, grown, and successfully exited multiple businesses in various industries. Alan grew his previous business from startup to four years later being named by Business Review Weekly as one of Australia's fastest growing companies. Today we talk about how customer service and contact center leaders can be more savvy about marketing and how marketers can better understand what happens in the post-sales experience. Please enjoy Alan Dibb. Alan, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast all the way from Melbourne. Is it really early morning right now for you uh, it's 7 a.m uh but it's uh it's tuesday so i'm in the future oh you are you're in the future how's yeah. tuesday are going so far the for all future of us? is bright <laughs> oh good <laughs> so my audience we were just chatting before the podcast started customer service professionals contact center leaders what are some of the common questions that you get as a marketer from this new world where now leaders are having to market to customer service and they're having to straddle the worlds of contact center and marketing. Do you have any yeah, I, I, frequently asked questions you get? Yeah, I, I love that, um, you know, you're working with professionals who are in customer service. So a lot of people feel like, hey, customer service, the marketing's already been done, right? You've got the customer, you've got the sale, the, the marketing's already been done. And I think um, it's great that people are thinking now more and more about how do we sell to existing customers? How do we create a world-class experience? How do we get uh, more frequency, more volume, move people to a, a higher level of service? So one of the, one of the things that a lot of people uh, don't understand is that the bulk of the, the revenue and the bulk of the value that you'll get from a customer is after they've become a customer. So the lifetime value and really increasing that lifetime value over time and being able to uh, deliver a world-class experience so that it's easy to get referrals. It's easy to get really good reviews. It's easy to get um, really positive testimonials from a client. And those are things that will create a real virtuous cycle. Since you're the marketing expert, what are some common misunderstandings about modern marketing that you wish that people would understand? Yeah. One of the biggest things we work on is, and you'll notice, uh, so I've, I've got a process called the one page marketing plan where literally in a single page, you can create a, a marketing plan. And it's very much by design that the very first block of that marketing plan is target market, right? Who are our people? Who are the people that we're going to serve? And, you know, most business owners and most uh, people say, everyone, hey, our product is awesome. We can serve everyone right everyone is in our in our target market and that's a huge huge mistake because if you say it's everyone it's really no one right. and so you you need to figure out who are your people who are the people that we're going to serve which also implies who are not our people who are not our ideal clients and who are people we're not actively going to go after right absolutely i feel like that's so important in life even just for yourself everybody watching listening like who what is for me, what is not for me, and then getting really clear on that. What I love about this one page idea in your book, you know, one one page of marketing is that, I know that's not the actual book name, but that's the idea of the book, is <laughs> condensing complication, chaos, down to a beautiful, simple piece of strategy that's just very clear. Can you just talk about your book and what actually should be on that one page marketing plan? Yeah, um, a long time ago, a mentor taught me, and it's really stuck with me, that we get paid as entrepreneurs for simplifying the complex. That's our job. So regardless of what you do, what industry you're in, you're there to simplify the complex. So, you know, when, when we think of, you know, wildly successful startups like an Uber and or Airbnb and so on, 
they simplified the complex, right? So now you push a button and a car arrives at your location. So it simplified something that was a lot more complex. It removed steps. So that to me is really the core essence of what we do as entrepreneurs. And so um, the book came about because from my own marketing struggles. So I was a dead broke IT geek struggling to get clients in the door. And, you know, I read every book, I went to every seminar, I did coaching and I, I learned it uh, via trial and error. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by training. So to me, the way I think about the world is in processes and steps. Step one, you do this. Step two, you do that. Step three, you do this and you should get a pretty reliable outcome. And so I was very frustrated that as far as I could tell, there was nothing out there that gave me that step by step, like here, you know, nothing, follow these steps. And that's how you'll create a marketing system that actually works. And so I had to learn through trial and error and taking little bits and pieces from here and there and adding them together. And so for that reason, uh, I wrote the book that I wish I had and the process that I wish I had when I was first learning marketing. I think that's why it's resonated with a lot of people because um, it's something that can take someone from zero and literally in the, in the book, we assume nothing. Uh, we literally define what is marketing, what is a brand and really very, very simply outline how to go from knowing absolutely zero about marketing to having a sophisticated marketing plan in the end. So that's really the origin of the book and, um, wh uh, why I felt like, uh, putting it together in one page was just the best way because most marketing plans are super complex, super long. You need a consultant, all of those sorts of things. And so if we have a one-page marketing plan, that makes it really easy to update. It's something that we can share with our team. We can share with our suppliers and vendors. You're getting a new website, great. Hopefully your web developer is asking you who your target market is, about your messaging, about how you're reaching your clients. And so great, you can share with them your one-page marketing plan. Really, really easy to do. Alan, so because you mentioned it, you said that one of the things you do, step one, is you just simply ask with the reader, like, what is marketing? What is branding? Can we do that exercise together right now? Of course. All right. So, so well, I'll let, let, you let me ask you, what, 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 what do you, when you hear the word marketing or when you hear the word branding, what, what comes to your mind? What do you, what do you think of? For branding, that's more of an uh, intangible, but for me, it's yeah. similar to customer experience. It's how are you making the customer feel? And I like to yeah. break it down really simple, like, oh, it's a vibe. Like that's not a very business-minded term, but what is the yeah. vibe you create for a customer? And then when yeah. we think of marketing, obviously, we're just generating awareness. How do we generate an awareness and demand for our product? And that can vary a lot for people like us. You know, we're authors and speakers to like Coca-Cola, to a retailer, mm -hmm. to an auto body shop. So that can range quite a bit. How'd I do? Nice. You did, you, you did, you did very well. I'll give you, I'll give you my couple of simple definitions. So, um, and I'll actually, I'll read this little paragraph straight out of the book where, where literally the, the heading is what is marketing? Cause a lot of people confuse marketing and branding and and uh a lot of times we we've all been confused into thinking this is much more difficult and complicated than it really is it's really simple like um as i said uh, it's very easy to make something more complex it's really hard to make things simpler and so um really that's my job is to help uh, uh, simplify the complex so here, here's what i wrote in my book is i'll just read the little paragraph which gives you a basically a jargon-free definition of marketing. So if the circus is coming to town and you paint a sign saying circus coming to the showground Saturday, that's advertising. If you put the sign on the back of an elephant and walk it into town, that's promotion. If the elephant walks through the mayor's flower bed and the local newspaper writes a story about it, that's publicity. And if you get the mayor to laugh about it, that's public relations. If the town citizens go to the circus, spend a lot of money, have a lot of fun, ask questions, and then and then spend a lot of money, that's sales. And if you plan the whole thing, that's marketing. So really, marketing is the strategy that we use to get our ideal clients to know us, like us, and trust us enough to become a, a, a customer. So we're looking for ideal clients, and we want people to know us, like us, and tr trust us to, to buy from us. So 
all the other stuff that we often associate with marketing, the advertising, the social media, all of these things, these are tactics and these are important. Um, but I think um, it's really important to know, okay, what is marketing? It's really about getting our ideal audience to know us, like us, and trust us. So now we've got a, a definition and we can think about, okay, great, who is our ideal audience? And then, okay, what's a process we can take them through so that they get to know us, so that they know that we exist, so they get to like us and trust us, and so they get to buy from us for the first time, and then, of course, get to buy from us repeatedly, refer new people to us, ascend to our higher level programs, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I love that. That, wow, what a mic drop, like that storytelling. I love that so much. Um, and I think that's why your book has resonated and sold so well, because like we really just need simplicity with these things. When we think about right. where does customer experience fit in all of those things with the elephant, do you have an answer? Absolutely. So re really, uh, customer experience, and, and, and in fact, I've dedicated one third of the marketing plan to what I call the after phase, which is very much customer experience. So uh, I've split up the, if, you, if you're looking vi visually or thinking visually, the one page marketing plan is nine blocks. So three blocks. So we've got a before phase. So that's the before phase is before anyone knows you even exist. So that's what you do with your messaging, with your advertising, with your social media, whatever. Then there's the during phase. That's when someone's kind of raised their hand and they're look, saying, look, I'm vaguely interested in what you've got to offer. And that might be, maybe they clicked on your ad. Maybe they phoned in your, your office. Maybe they uh, interacted with your social media post. They're like, this seems interesting. Tell me more. I want to know more. And so that's the during phase. And then there's the after phase, which is very much what your audience uh, live in and, and work in. And that's really taking someone who's purchased for the first time. And we've got three blocks dedicated to, to that after phase. Number one is deliver a world-class experience. So how can they have an amazing experience where we're turning people from being just uh, customers to raving fans? And then the, the, the second block of the after phase is how do we increase customer lifetime value? How do we get them to buy in more volume, more frequency, higher quality, whatever's relevant in, in your business? And finally, orchestrating and stimulating referrals. So how do we get people who love what we do and get to orchestrate and stimulate referrals? So that kind of indicates it's a it's not a passive thing. Most people hope and pray for referrals. And, you know, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But how can we be more intentional and orchestrate and stimulate referrals, indicating that it's something active that we do? So that whole after phase is completely dedicated to people listening right now and working in those phases every single day, which is really the most important part of the plan. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I think there's something going on now where the people involved in with the elephant in the beginning really want to understand more what's happening in the after phase. In the after phase, people also want to be more involved what's happening in the pre-sales phase because if these two don't work together, there's a disconnect for the customer. When a customer calls a contact center and says, oh, I got this promotion, and the contact center says, what promotion? What are you talking about? And there's just so many broken experiences because of these miscommunications and breakdowns. Um, I just keep thinking of this elephant uh, in, in the elephant's journey. <laughs> the so, elephant in the room. <laughs> yes. So what advice do you have for, for these two siloed groups, the, the pre-sale, the post-sale? How can they better collaborate together? Uh, this is so important. And you really brought up something super, super important because um, – as you say, I mean, how often have have you and I been a customer of a, a product or a company or whatever, and, you know, sales made all of these big grand promises, then there's literally no handover to delivery or customer service or post-sale support. And you're like, hang on, I was promised all of those things, or this was supposed to be included or whatever else. And now you're having an argument and it's completely destroyed that customer experience. And Conversely, um, we've probably all been customers where the handover was very, very smooth. It reminds me, my friend uh, Joey Coleman wrote a book, Never Lose a Customer Again, and he talks about I'm how... reading it right now, by the way. Oh, perfect, perfect. Uh, so really good book. He talks about how important the first 100 days of a 
client uh, onboarding is, right? So the handover from your sales team to your customer service team and so on. So because that's going to that's really going to frame your relationship with them long term. And so if if you've completely messed up that first hundred days, that's gonna you're starting the relationship on a pretty poor note, and clients will leave, clients will churn, clients will have buyers regret or buyers remorse. Uh-huh. So really, really important to have a very smooth onboarding experience and a very smooth handover from your sales team to your customer service. And so that you're fulfilling those promises, nothing worse than, you know, unfulfilled promises, uh, especially when, uh, you know, a sale has been made based on that and there's very little handover or very little, you know, continuity from there. So I don't see those things as different as the sales department being different from the customer service. I think they really need to be very well integrated, a lot of good communication. And importantly, both sales and customer service have deep, deep insights into the customer. Like what is, what are the fears the customer has? What are the frustrations they have? Why are they buying our product rather than the competitor? What are some of the, what are some of the things that are holding them back? What are, what are some of the objections we're getting or what are some of the complaints that we're getting? This is super, super valuable uh, data that's used in the product development process, in the marketing process, because a lot of times the work that my team and I do is figuring out some of the messaging with our clients. So, and where we start is literally we say, hey, let's pull up your help desk. I want to have a look at your customer service tickets. I want to see what are people complaining about? What are people saying is really awesome? Because a lot of times the people, the folks in marketing and sales don't even know. They're like, hey, people are buying our product because of this feature and we're selling this other feature. Or, you know, people are are really concerned about this thing, but we're talking about that other thing. So what we want to do is what I call entering the conversation going on in the mind of our ideal prospect. So what are they dreaming about? What are they fearing? What are they hoping for? And so this is stuff that people in customer service have at their fingertips. They know exactly they're on the pulse of why people are buying the product, why people are not buying the product, why people are asking for refunds or complaining. um, What are their fears, frustrations, dreams, all of those things. This is such, such important intel. And so you've got the ability to share that with your sales team, your product development team. Very, very vital. That's interesting. So when you start working with a client, you actually go to the support tickets and you say, what are the biggest offenders, basically? Absolutely. Because I I, want to know, um, first of all, I want to know, do we have a leaky bucket? So are we... Are we making sales, but we're losing people on the other end because of some unfulfilled promise, or maybe there's a problem with the product, or maybe we've just sold the right, the right product, but to the wrong people. So there's a mismatch in terms of, hey, we're, we're actually selling the wrong, the right product, but to the wrong, wrong people. Um, do we have a positioning issue? So were people expecting like a high-end product, but they got a mid-range version or or the other way around, maybe people, uh, you know, paying a, a low cost, but they, they're getting something that, wow, they, they didn't expect. So I want to know people who are actual buyers of our product, what do they think about it? And we conduct interviews with them as well. We want to figure out, hey, what do you like about this company? And what do you, you know, what are some of the challenges that you've experienced? So we want to fix any leaky buckets that exist. And then we, that's the best way to tap into uh, the mind of a prospect, people who've actually bought. And so what was your thought process? What, 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 uh, one of the questions we often ask someone who's bought is what almost made you not buy? Like what were your, you know, there's always those two or three little objections. You're like, I'm not sure, but you, you got over the line, but what were those things? Because chances are there's thousands of other people who've had the same objection and not bought as well. Mm-hmm. So what are the results of a client doing an exercise like this? Like what do they get when they actually dig into these these questions? It's very, very eye-opening. And a lot of times the business leaders have n- no idea of what's going on inside of the the customer service side of things. And they're sometimes they're very shocked. Um, about what's going on, some of the band-aid kind of um, uh, solutions that are being applied and things like that. So often it, they're embarrassed and they're shocked, but sometimes they're also pleasantly surprised. They're like, 
hey, I didn't realize customers valued this part of our product. Like we keep getting really good feedback about, you know, this part of our product or this part of our service, in which case there's a missed opportunity there. We should be talking about that in our sales and in our marketing. So it, it goes both ways. But I, I think every business leader should spend some time every month answering help desk and support tickets and being on the customer service line. That's one of the best ways to really be on the pulse of what's actually happening in your in your business. Do you think there's a culture shift or a culture difference in a company where the leaders are happy to do this versus where leaders really don't want to be bothered? They felt like, I didn't sign up to work in customer service. What's the difference in culture there? Well, a- absolutely. I think it's, it's hugely a huge difference. So leaders who care about the customer experience and who, you know, are not above spending some time in customer service and knowing what's going on with the customer, they're going to have a much, much bigger result. So those who feel like they're above it or don't have time for it or whatever, I mean, what is more impactful in your organization than your relationship with your clients? I can't, I really can't think of anything. And so to me, the whole role of a CEO or a business leader is to remove bottlenecks from the organization. So, um, and bottlenecks can be, you know, sometimes in sales, sometimes in marketing. Most of the time when I start working with a client, I'll ask, where do you think the bottleneck is in the business? Because if there were no bottlenecks, we would, we would be scaling massively, massively fast. And most of the time they say, oh, we're not getting enough leads or we're not getting enough sales or we're not closing enough or whatever. And then we really start digging into the numbers and I'm like, you're losing a lot of customers each, each month or each year or whatever. I'm looking, looking at the numbers. Uh, why do you think that is? Um, and so when we start digging in, often there is either a problem with the product or the way that the product was sold. Maybe the product was sold too aggressively to people who really couldn't afford it, or they just weren't an ideal client, or there's a problem with the product or the customer service is not great or whatever else. And so really plugging that leaky bucket is such an important part of what we do. And even though it's really not marketing, right? So it really is not marketing in the traditional sense, but it really is. It's like, let's get, let's get our base sorted. Let's plug that bucket before we pour more water in, because we can turn that tap on, we can get that bucket filled up, but it's going to cost a lot if we keep getting clients in and then they fall back out. You know, some of these big companies, they're so big that it just feels like to even start digging into the support tickets, it's just such a massive undertaking. Do you use any type of technology to do this or do you just do it manually? Um, most Mostly it's manually. We, we look for recurring patterns, really, and they're generally not hard to spot. You know, if, if I look at a month's worth of your support tickets start flicking through, I'll usually start seeing recurring themes pretty often. It's like, guys, you know, I canceled my plan and my char- my card got charged again, or, you know, this is broken or whatever. And you start seeing patterns pretty, pretty quickly. Um, I'm sure that there'd, there'd be technologies kind of, uh, emerging, especially with AI and everything like that, where we may be able to just to suck in the whole months of tickets and be able to see recurring patterns. I'm sure that's not too far off. I haven't seen anything just yet that does this, but really it doesn't take a lot of effort to start reviewing tickets manually and just seeing even even if you didn't read the the ticket in full or the the support desk uh, um, replies in full a lot of times they'll categorize them into yeah, into hello? sections so this was a credit, yeah. this was a billing dispute this was a, a whatever a complaint of some sort or some broken product or a return or whatever so and that can often tell us a story as well like if you know 90% of our tickets are about, you know, uh, a shipping issue or whatever. Okay, we can now sort of hone into that a little bit. If you had one message for our audience, one closing message about modern marketing that so many are just missing, what is one message you could leave us with before we get into the rapid fire fun round? Um, so if, if there's one message I would tell people is that no one knows how good your marketing is before they buy. People only know how good your marketing is after they buy. So your whole goal, especially as someone in customer service is you, you, you're in a marketing role, right? So 
uh, b before they buy, they don't know how good your product or service is. And so uh, that I think that's a really, really powerful concept to walk away with. The second thing I'll, I'll add to that is everybody's in marketing, right? Everybody is in sales. Everybody is in marketing. You know, I think anybody in an organization is authorized to bring in more sales and more revenue. And so that's a large part of what you do. And you're in the most important part of the marketing plan in the business. So um, it's not something that, you know, it's a big mistake to think of that as a post-sale kind of thing, as an after, uh, after a sale thing. No, this is something that's going to retain revenue, retain clients, and potentially increase it over time. All right, Alan, let's do a little rapid fire before we let you go. Does that sound fun? Are you ready? Sounds great. Let's do it. Okay. All right. First question. What does your morning routine look like? Um, I spend the morning with a, I start with a green tea and then I'll read for an, uh, about 40 minutes. Wow. Okay. Wonderful. Do you have a unique leadership hack that helped get you to where you are today? Yep. Hire only A players. I don't work with B or C players. Oh, that's, that's good. What do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? Um, I work out and I, I, I have a forest nearby where I, I love walking. What is your favorite leadership book or resource? John Maxwell. Uh, I like his book. I, I, can't, I can't remember the, the name. I think it's Thinking for a Change, if I'm not mistaken. So he, he has some really, really good leadership material. I love his books. Oh my gosh, I'm reading some right now. What's your idea of perfect happiness? Perfect happiness is when you're not wanting anything else. What is one mental health strategy for managing hard days? Um, nature. What is your favorite type of vacation? An active vacation, doing things, uh, hiking, uh, getting out there and seeing things. Awesome. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? I think it's... Um, it's probably uh, very stereotypical, but I, I would have loved to have met Steve Jobs. If you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? Just do it. I love that. Well, this has been so fun. And gosh, I feel like I need to go to Melbourne and take one of your workshops. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll come to Los Angeles and you'll do like an entrepreneur workshop and I can take it. You don't have to come to Melbourne. We, we do them online all the time. So you're very welcome, Blake. <laughs> okay. Hey, I might take you up on that. I really like what you had to say today. Well, thank you so much. And if our listeners and viewers want to get in touch with you or take any of your courses or, or content, how can they do that? Sure. So the book is The One Page Marketing Plan. It's very popular on audio. So it's on audible.com. Um, our uh, website is successwise.com. You can join our mailing list and we send out free free tips every uh, a couple of a couple of times every week. So uh, love to see everyone there. All right. Well, thank you so much. Everyone has been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Uh -huh.